So now our first panel bears the title uh, Industry Leaders' Perspectives on the Need for Digital Competences. And I, I guess we all agree that the notion of digital competences comprises more than skills, of, uh, skills to use of today's uh, software. But what exactly? We discuss this topic with our panelists, which are Thomas Sattelberger, former Chief Human Resources uh, Officer of the Deutsche Telekom and one of those top managers in Germany who want to change more than just one company. <laughs> Uh, Franz Fehrenbach, President of the Supervisory Board at World Bosch GmbH. He is well known for promoting research, higher education and ecological responsibility of the industry. Sean Corcoran, already um, introduced to you, manager at Steelcase Education Solutions. He has hands-on experience in developing advanced technologies for educational purposes. And happy to, we are happy to have uh, Mr. Sangwoo Kim with us, uh, President of Corporate Affairs of Samsung Europe, a top manager on the international level who is deeply involved in European uh, Korean cooperation. So please uh, enter the floor <laughs> that we can start. <laughs> Perfect. Please take a seat. Oh. Hi. Nice to meet you. Okay, please take a seat. Great to meet you. Hello. So, uh, since we are many panelists and a tight uh, time constraint, constraint we, sh we want to abandon the common ritual of initial statements. Uh, I guess this would be uh, greeted with pleasure by the floor as well. And I'd like instead to pose some questions. And uh, um, when we talk the need, uh, about the need for uh, digital competences, what are they actually? Perhaps you, would, perhaps you would like to answer. Mm. What are, they, are they skills? Are they abilities, knowledge, insight, attitudes, or a set of emotions, or just experience? What are those digital competences? I think uh, you need a little bit of everything. Mm -hmm. And what is important is from what kind of position are you looking at this digitization. There is a big field, large field of, let me call it, operational digitization. Mm -hmm. And I, as an older executive, will never be as good as a digital native on operational digitization. I have to know about it, but I should not try to compete with the digital uh, natives, with the nerds, to be on the same level as they. But I have to understand what's going on. And there's a second field, which is for leaders, for executives, very important. This is, let me call it, the strategic competence you need. You have to understand what is possible with cloud computing, mm -hmm. what kind of impact has a, a digital cloud platform on your business? We see this in Germany. We talk a lot about Industry 4.0, which I think is, a, is, a, is not the right word for the disruptive development we see there. Because everybody thinks then we talk about industry, but we are not talking about industry. We are talking about a digitally, digitally connected world. Mm -hmm. So production goes totally out of your manufacturing walls. Up till now, production was in your factory and was capsuled with your, wa with your walls. And now you are going out. And you have to understand what does this mean for your business. And I would call this strategic competence mm -hmm. on the digitization. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Anybody wants, wants to add something to that, this distinction, to that idea? Well, if we, uh, I fully uh, agree with you, Mr. Fehrenbach, if we, when we talk about industry 4.0, we forget the whole world of service, which is called smart services. And not just smart services of business, but also smart services of the state, of the government, for example. Of a, of, a, of a health institution or whatsoever. Now, uh, let's say reflecting 
uh, our country naturally we are very production orientated yes. and the service issue and the smart service issue mm -hmm. obviously we have a development and this might even count for a whole continental Europe that the digital powerhouse US is distancing itself tremendously from the mechanical powerhouse continental Europe and Germany and the machinery powerhouse of Asia and China with low engineering skills naturally and but low cost skills is moving ahead so the continent and also Germany as one of the leading nations is coming into a sandwich position because we just think out of industrial out of an industrial logic in your view yeah, yeah. Uh, of pleasure. course I agree with you a little bit over everything and I'd like to add uh, more than that uh, which is I would say is a kind of culture or environment so uh, as an one of the older generation I, I was born in uh, 60s and there was no computer when I went to the high school uh, but I tried to, to learn how to code and how to use the, the, the digital devices but it's very uh, it is different from the young generation uh, which are uh, which, which face the digital devices from the from uh, since they were mm -hmm. born so uh, we can learn skill we can learn how to code but the culture or the way of thinking is the the fundamental is very hard to catch up uh, for the, 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 the older generation. So uh, what I'm trying to say is to, it is very important to start the young generation to experience the digital environment from the young, young age. So, so culturally, and they can be uh, disclosed to, to the digital environment. So I think it's very important. The role of culture. Okay. Yeah, I just thought I'd add that you know, as a as a, a business person, um, and I think of of the the young kids that are coming into our our world, our business, and what we expect and what we need, and and I think the the term strategy. I mean, the the term innovation. We heard it earlier. Is you know, maybe it's a buzzword, but I've certainly learned that it's it's critical to survive in business, um, innovation is critical. And so I think an aspect of digital competence, I think, um, that I think helps us innovate is the ability to integrate um, a lot of, of aspects of the digital world to innovate. So it's not just about communicating, using digital technology to communicate, you know, maybe that's at the end of the stream. If I go back up front, how do we use digital technology to explore, to create, and then to communicate? And I think, I think a digital competency would include the integration of all of those, the understanding of all of those, and how to leverage mm -hmm. technology uh, and digital to actually deliver innovation. But what has culture to do the, with that? What has What's culture to do with that, with that ability to integrate, for instance, or? Well, well, Richard Florida, I think about 14 years ago, wrote about technology, talent, and tolerance. And he created, he created the, the term creative ecology. Now when we look, and creative ecology is a culture of innovation and self-invented learning. And, and sometimes I even question if some of our school systems are failed systems and if we might need to create new creative ecologies as third places to revitalize and refresh the schooling system because mm. how do you put in old structures and old cultures mm. how do you, br do you bring in innovation that's an issue actually companies are also struggling. Mm -hmm. That's why we are creating transformation labs. That's why we are creating innovation camps. That's why we send our engineers and developers in co-working spaces. Because our old culture is, not, is so strong 
that it is resisting innovation capabilities. So culture for me is a key issue, and, and I was very happy to see that the, in the keynote, the European Union approach was about creative ecology, not about individual competencies in the first hand, but about creative ecology, and then about individual competencies, because you don't build individual competencies in a rotten culture. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so, what, so what went wrong? Are we still sticking to a, a top-down top-down culture, uh, like a pyramid, or um, didn't we learn? I, I mean, I remember uh, debates of industry leaders uh, um, 20 years ago at uh, Hanover Fair, uh, where we had all those talks about, um, well, um, the role of the floor shop, a more bottom-up uh, bottom uh, organization strategy. Has all this failed? No. Okay. <laughs> I think, I'm uh, happy to hear that. <laughs> <laughs> a lot of our success today as uh, the German industry, with all our uh, success uh, on the technology side, is exactly mm. based on that. But as Mr. Sattelberger said, this success right now is very dangerous for us. Because, let's say, the backbone of the German industry are the small and mid-sized companies. Everybody knows this from mm. Germany they start now to recognize that they have to change to the digitization. First of all, there is a recognition problem. They are not aware that they new, need new competencies. There was a study some weeks ago, and uh, they asked some thousand small companies, what do you think what Industry 4.0 will bring to your company? 84% said, they simplify my work processes. Mm -hmm. And only about 20% of these companies recognized that we come to totally new business models which are data-driven. So, let's say you are a leader in one of these companies, are technologically very strong, and now you have the wish to change to a more digitalized company. You go out to the market and try to hire somebody, you are not finding somebody. And this is a big danger for the industry power of Germany. But what so, are the competencies that so are missing? Sorry. The success today is based on what you just mentioned, okay. on your Hannover Fair. But now we have to change very fast. And I always hate when somebody says Germany has a perfect starting position mm -hmm. because we are so strong on the engineering side. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But we have to say at the same time, we are extremely weak on the digital side, extremely weak, and this is very, a very big danger for us. Well, this comes back to my initial question, which kind of competencies are lacking? You mentioned the, uh, the ability to integ uh, uh, of integrated thinking, so right. what else? <laughs> or is that all? What is that? Is that all uh, uh, what is uh, lacking? So what, what, what kind well. of digital competencies are in need? Well, I mean, I would add, you know, a mindset, um, an openness, mm -hmm. um, um, you know, a, a willingness to fail early, to succeed sooner, um, to experiment, to prototype, right. um, you know, to iterate. I think mm -hmm. these are all connected. But um, all that is uh, more or less psychological. That's a big key part of it, yeah. Okay. And, and cultural. Okay. I mean, I think of when you ask the culture question, I think of you know, playing tennis, and, and maybe I'm a mediocre player and I play somebody else that's just a little better or a lot better, that's going to raise my game. And I think having a culture of, mm -hmm. you know, of, of, you know, talent that truly shares and, 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 and is, is set up to, uh, to share and, and grow everybody, I think is critical. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And let me, let me add one more thing. Uh, With pleasure. Yes, I, I, I think uh, what we really need is uh, creativeness, because we have, we have the, the, the similar problem as uh, German industry, as you just told, that uh, we are very strong at making uh, hardware, smartphones, but uh, in other uh, global companies, like uh, some American companies, they are focused on the data and software. So we 
we have a lot of uh, resources about uh, the software area, but we still need to strengthen the strategic uh, the, the performance about uh, the software area. So we are struggling to improve our capability. So there are many uh, software engineers who are qualified for the excellence in, 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 in coding, but also we still need the creativeness and imagination and strategic uh, the invention. So that is what we really need to the digital, uh, must be combined with digital skill. Mm -hmm. yep. I, I, would, I would absolutely agree with that. I, I'm an engineer, you know, I've been in product development my, most of my career, uh, and I can remember working with different engineers, um, developing new products. And you might have an engineer who's incredible in the skill of the CAD work, you know, the computer-aided design. And you might have a guy next to him or a girl that maybe isn't as good at the CAD work, but they can actually think, you know, analog. Somebody mentioned analog early. Get their ideas out on paper. Create before spending all that time polishing something in detail. And so mm. I think the creative piece is a critical part um, exactly. to have a more holistic, mm -hmm. you know, effective uh, result. It's not just the technical. Mm. It's, it's, the, it's the whole person mm -hmm. and the thinking mm -hmm. behind the use of the technical. So social competence. Yes. Yeah. yeah. I'm not sure if the focus on the individual competency is not a big error. Probably, if, we, if I look in co on companies, it is how do we design working spaces? Mm -hmm. How do we invest in collaborative tools? Mm -hmm. What kind of hierarchy do we have? Strict? and tight, or lean, and coaching. So the investment, uh, you know, when, when, I, when I looked, when I Googled, I, I could see about 20 lists of competencies in Europe on what's, what is digital competencies. Like when we, uh, 40 years ago, when we talked about what is social methodolog methodological and, and personal competencies and professional, we had those whole lists, it didn't help us at all. Probably the designing capability is a key, it has become a key issue. Designing companies and designing cities. I had for two days ago a discussion with an entrepreneur in Stuttgart who said the new train station, it's not the problem, but it's cutting the city and its creative parts apart. Mm -hmm. So it's a completely different perspective on how do we create creative ecologies in cities, in companies, and so on. And this is, from my point of view, the ne neglected part in the discussion about digital competencies. Mm -hmm. It rings a bell because I work in a company uh, which relies on creativity, and this rings a bell, what you say. Uh, I see it similar as Mr. Sattelberger, and we try to overcome this uh, by various, uh, let's say, leadership and organizational methods. For example, we introduced now mixed teams where we have very young digital natives in, which are very capable. Uh, they have a level I will never achieve, but we mix them with experienced, older seniors, and they create together in this development mm -hmm. process. Mm -hmm. So, you, and then leadership is asked, yeah? You need a very good leader mm -hmm. who can coach both sides right. so that they bring both strengths they have together. And then, then we are coming forward. And uh, we just, uh, next month we will uh, uh, invite, uh, or the Chancellor Merkel is coming to us to Stuttgart Renningen. We just built a new uh, campus for research for 300 million, and there we went exactly to these flat hierarchies and totally new working environments. If you don't do that, don't expect that something will change. So you have to combine all, all of these aspects. And Mr. Fernbach, what would that mean for a traditional school and a traditional university yeah. in Germany? Mm -hmm. 
What is a creative ecology at the Technical University Stuttgart yeah. or Munich? That's a question. Okay, <laughs> okay perhaps. Well, sometimes, some, sometimes it's boring to have a, a common point in, in a discussion. But sometimes, <laughs> like today, <laughs> it is more convergence to a very interesting, to, to a very interesting point. And I would propose that you participate now uh, at our debate. That's I good. guess we got uh, floor mics somewhere. So if you want to uh, contribute to this debate, pose questions, give remarks, or criticism. Please. Here in the front. And would you mind, please mind to, would you mind to introduce yourself? Okay, my name is Günter Koch. I come from Austria. Um, in uh, 1972, there was the first faculty uh, in computer science founded in Karlsruhe. And in that period, between 72 and say 78, we developed a lot of conceptual ideas, meaning Karlsruhe is one of the places in Germany where this whole movement, which we talk about today on digital competence, started in some way. <clears throat> and what I discovered today, after how much is it, 40 years, roundabout, many of the ideas which were developed at that time, say on algorithmization, for example, as we heard before, or Industry 4.0, were already in some way developed at that time, meaning uh, we wrote some teach books where all these concepts were already there. And my question would be, why does it take so long until, let's say, such kind of fundamental ideas, which has a lot of influence today, comes into daily practice? Why did it take that long? Anybody who remembers Peter Naur, the, the uh, yes. computer scientist from, from Denmark who I think in the, in the 70s or in the early 80s uh, wrote, I think, two books about um, programming as a, human, as a human activity. So why did it take so long that, uh, until today that finally those issues come in, in, in focus? Any idea? Yesterday night I had a conversation and this person said, in the meantime, the Catholic Church is changing faster ahead than German school and university systems. <laughs> now, the power of a great leader. <laughs> but be beyond, beyond that choke, there is a bloody reality. Because when we talk about the entrepreneurial university or the founding university or the cross-disciplinarity or breaking up of silos, uh, we do not see major changes. Mm -hmm. Now, this has to do a lot with history, defined roles, definitions, rituals. It also has to do with power. Because cross-disciplinarity means collaborative power, mm -hmm. not being a chair. And that's a big difference. And, and so, the ho my, my, my guess is, and in, my, in, in our initiatives in Minden, and, 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 and I, we, we both are, uh, you are still much more active in business than I am, but we both are engaged in, in really in, in making third places, Wissensfabrik, uh, or maker garages. If we look at the schooling system, that we have the so-called Fächerkanon, which is not broken up. So and if you talk about digitization, you don't talk about a subject. You talk about a mindset, which should, kind of in a project-oriented way, go across the curriculum of, of a school. But this means, up, means giving up traditional roles as a mathematic teacher, as a religion teacher, whatsoever. And, and, and if we do not start this institutional process, mm -hmm in reforming our institutions, not just our curricula, we will fail. That's my deep belief. Mm. I do not want to blame anybody because we as companies are also very slow learner. Because uh, shifting is always a, a change process. And all change processes 
are very difficult to handle in big organization, I tell you. Because it's a huge leadership task. And sometimes we are not good in that. So I do not, bl do not want to blame anybody. But as Mr. Sattelberger mentioned, now we have a, not a joint point, but uh, we are really both active. Ten years ago, we founded the Wissensfabrik, which is an association among German companies, because we were not successful with all our contacts to the ministries, to the school, to the universities, to bring more attention that we need more technical competencies already at the kindergarten. For example, you mentioned this. It's one thing is to know how to wish the new medias, but to understand what's behind it. Mm -hmm. This is important for our industrial position here. Mm -hmm. if, if we don't create young people who are interested to understand how does a smartphone work and how does it connect to the internet and all the other stuff or to the cloud, if they only want to use it as a social media, then we will not generate in Germany the next generation of smartphones or something else. So we founded this Wissensfabrik and in the meantime, I have to say, we are 130 companies. We do it all on our own expenses. And our position was, if we don't do something from the industry, we cannot uh, blame the politicians that they are not doing the right things or, or, or the schools. Right now, I'm very active. And it's a little bit, really, I, I'm afraid. When you see what all would be needed at schools, you need Mint, you need IT, you need economic. In Baden-Württemberg, we are just successful. From next year on, we will introduce the, the, the subject economics again into the curricula of the, of the teachers. Right now, Mr. Kretschmann, our minister president, said digitization is a most important subject for our country, Baden-Württemberg. At the same time, his Kultus minister has canceled IT out of the schedules for the teachers. Mm -hmm. I went really through the roof. We will change it again. But I mean, there, there are so many deficiencies and we cannot afford them for the future. We have really to speed up here on all levels. You know, um, for all the innovation that comes out of, of education, you yeah. know, especially that's a, that's higher a, that's education. That's the base, huh? Yeah, I mean, the, the research, the, yeah. you know, it spawns so many things. The, ac the academy itself is highly resistant to innovation. Yeah. Um, and I think there's, there's just antibodies and, uh, what would I say, just uh, a support system or a, uh, a, not a compensation system, but a reward system, a reward system that doesn't reward change. And I think that's a fundamental problem. Mr. Mm. Yeah. does this sound familiar or strange to you? Well, I'm, I'm not the, I think I'm not the right person to answer the question, but uh, I, I think I can say uh, about how, how Korea is doing, mm -hmm. uh, how yes. Korea uh, made it so fast. So in the 1950s, Korea was uh, destroyed. Everything was destroyed. Even just one factory uh, were there in, in Korea. Uh, and and in, in early 60s, many Korean miners and nurses came to here, to Germany, to, to, to make a seed money to start our economic development. But in only in a half century, we are now considered as the, the, actually the most innovative country in the world the, by the survey from the European Commission. So what is the secret? Well, I think it is the, the uh, motivation. motivation. So uh, the Korean government and the political leaders and all Korean people want you to, 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 to catch up with the, 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 uh, the developed country. So, uh, po politically and uh, from the policy side, it was uh, backed mm -hmm. to, to in, uh, huge uh, investment see. to support for, for the industry, business. Yeah, yes, and uh, education. Another, another secret is education because Korea is a relatively small country without any natural resources like uh, petroleum or minerals. So only resource we have is human. So about the resource, human resource, we have to educate them. So all Korean parents are, uh, I, I would say, notorious to educate their children, <laughs> maybe too much. So 
I think it is the, well, uh, I don't know about your history, but it is about uh, our history. Mm -hmm, thank you. So any other, oh yes, please, uh, over there in, the gentleman over there with the tie. Sorry for that description. But. Oh, um, okay. Yeah. And af 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 after this gentle gentleman, it's your turn, and then yours. Okay, fine, I see you. Philip Gieland, uh, I'm a provider of e-learning, and if I listen to your, to your panel discussion, I have to add that uh, oftentimes it's a matter of power from the top, as you said, management power, and uh, as you mentioned, cultural change. I'm just asking myself, are we too good off at the moment, politically, um, peace, uh, economically, that there is no... Um, need to change or the change takes too long? Do we need a crisis? Because we can't wait, as you just mentioned, five or ten years until everybody accepts digitali digitalization, wherever, in industry, in education, or in government. What, what do we need to change before the crisis is here? I propose uh, to give the mic to this You got one, okay. Go on, please. Yeah. Um, well, my name is Rajiv. Uh, I'm coming from Aarhus University, Denmark, Center for Entrepreneurship. And uh, one of the things I do is I, I interact with a lot of engineers um, uh, when I'm trying to teach them entrepreneurship. And I think we go back to one of the basic things that I'm seeing here is this, this kind of mindset change. And if I ask you, especially uh, maybe to the panel, would you consider Einstein, for example, an entrepreneur? Now, a lot of people would say no because he was a great scientist, but he was not an entrepreneur. But if you actually look back, I think that's what we're actually losing. I think Einstein was the quintessential entrepreneur, and that was because he was ready to challenge the status quo. The status quo of classical mechanics that was accepted for 200 years, he was ready to go against it before he came up with the, with the special theory of relativity, which I think is what we're lacking in our students today because they are so readily accepting the laws or, or whatever that is there, they, they say this is how, yes, it works, and that's it. And that, I think, relates back to what you were saying in the center, that, uh, uh, that maybe students are you know, accepting things, technology, so easily in a way that they don't want to question how it has been built. And maybe this kind of questioning needs to get back. So in a way, maybe we need to get back to the basics and then also couple it with the kind of incentive structure that Sean was talking about. Okay, now it's your turn. Yeah. The gentleman over there. Okay, fine. Hello, I'm uh, Gerard Danford from Helsinki. And I spent last year v touring around the United States meeting with almost 100 um, higher education people in talking about online learning and trying to gather the cumulative wisdom from those people. And they are frustrated too with digital competency, I would say. I mean, I met one professor in, at the University of Washington called Michael Caulfield, who is kind of a leader in this space, and um, he would say that, you know, there are illusions of competency, you know, when it comes to these students. They think they know how to use these, techno these digital tools, but they really don't, and we need to teach them. And he started by talking about, we need to teach them how to develop a digital identity you need to have an identity online, which is representative of you, and you can use that to reach out to other people, you know, so they see something that's worth connecting. And also, he talked a lot about collaboration, that we need to teach them how to truly collaborate and contribute in a way, not just posting Facebook pages of flying pigs or whatever, but, you know, really sharing and commenting and giving feedback and contributing and adding to. So I think, there, I think we're all faced with this uh, challenge. I just wanted to say that it's not just Europe and it isn't just the US, so uh, we need to teach these uh, young people, these digital natives who we assume know how to use these technologies, we need to really show them how enabling they can be and um, I don't know exactly how we do that, but I just wanted to share with you that I think that it's a challenge everywhere. And thank you. Thank you. Any other remarks? Yes, please. 
in the front. Okay. I see Richard Straub. Just uh, one point to the question of institutional change. I think that was also one. How can we in our societies really get to the point where institutions that don't want to change and who are not built to change mm -hmm. can change? And it looks, it looks quite hopeless, right? If you, if you look at the history now, um, it was always catastrophes when you, when you achieve changes. There's one thing which also came up, I think, uh, the idea of building a new structure in parallel, of starting something and not waiting for the whole. We have this tendency to the whole system should change, and we fail. But if we start to build things, and mm -hmm. if we show that it's working, then sure. it might have, mm -hmm. um, it, it might be a, a way, and I think we're starting to do that, but not enough. Yeah, that mm -hmm. must become part of the policy process. Yes, please. Just you're the, the next one. Okay. Roland Berger from Stockholm University. I would just agree with, with Richard, and that's actually the, the open source principle. So why why did it took, take 40 years? Uh, was the question. Well, we have to remember what happened technology-wise in these 40 years. So we are at a, at a, at a totally different. Uh, stage now in a mm. technological development. I mean, the internet was there 40 years ago, but it was just a few nodes. Now it's pervasive, and the next revolution with Internet of Things will add to that. But, but this open source principle, actually, I think is the key, because it's not just academia resistant to change, mm -hmm. it's the banks, it's politics itself. And the revolution, that the core of the revolution is that it's like Lego building blocks now that you can change actually almost anyone can change. You look at the open source movement, you look at new startups that just do things. And this opens totally new possibilities. And I think there lies the hope that change can happen, that the resistance to change actually is not the main barrier anymore. Thank you. And now the gentleman in the back, and then I give back to the yeah. panel. Mm -hmm. OK. Yes. I just have a quick question, oh, no, actually. Yeah. Not, not for the moment. Uh, sorry. Uh, right. this then you and then the panel. OK. <laughs> I'm uh, Benjamin Wustenberg. I'm working at an education technology startup based in Berlin. And I would urge you to um, talk about first things first. So I mean, we need innovation. We need change, yes. Uh, we need literacy, yes. But we need internet in schools. And I'm serious about that. When I talk to teachers, and I, talk, I tend to talk to quite a few teachers, most schools in Germany don't have proper internet to connect 500 students at the same time with the internet. It's not happening. We don't have the infrastructure. As long as we don't solve that problem, we can have the next 15 sessions here and the next 15 conferences talking about it. Nothing will change. So, I mean, politics is not able to change it for some reason. Maybe the funds are not there. I don't know. So maybe. You know, uh, you guys have to do something about it. I know Samsung is doing quite a bit, uh, but even if Samsung would sponsor a tablet for all German students, it wouldn't change anything because we lack the infrastructure. That's the first thing we have to fix, and then we can talk about more stuff. Thank you. Now it's your turn, and then we have to get back to the panel. I'm uh, Alex Lecht. I'm in charge of uh, business Could development at Edifactory. It's a learning provider of uh, can training Can you speak solutions. a little bit louder? It's Sorry, can you hear me now? Yeah. 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 Um, I was actually just reacting on uh, Mr. Uh, Sattelberg's uh, comment when he said that uh, the system, uh, the educational system uh, as we know it might be wrong and might be not working. And I see how a collaborative solution can work in, uh, in the education in schools. But how do you see that working in the corporate and the environment? with all the barriers, all the politics uh, inside a company, how do you see collaborative work being easily uh, implantable, feasible, uh, working in a company? OK, so you I, start. I wanted to, some great uh, comments about, um, you know, there was a question or a comment about, do we need a crisis? Yep. And, mm -hmm. and I think we do. I think we have one. It's just that we haven't recognized it or haven't acknowledged it. Um, but there's, a, there's a, just a glaring irony here to me. And I know when I was thinking about you know, this topic of 
the need for digital competency. I mean, there's no question that we need to have digital competency. There was an implication that we don't have kids that have the right level of digital competency or whatnot. Well, it's not the problem. The kids aren't the problem. I mean, they know a lot more about digital than I do. Um, the system has to um, enable and foster the right kinds of uh, environments, ecology, um, uh, curricula, um, uh, uh, to, to, because they're going to learn. <laughs> They're going to learn. We, we need to help create the systems and the programs and the protocols and the, and the curricula uh, and the, the openness to let them thrive the way they will. Uh, they're digital natives. Um, we're holding them back. But you would agree that, uh, is uh, Professor Jos still here? The examples she showed. This we have to bring to schools. Mm -hmm. yeah, absolutely. Yeah? Yeah. So that's why I'm saying no, that's no, us. Not, not uh, the, yeah. the request, let's say, to put all, only computers and internet in the schools. Yeah. We have to bring the right stuff to the schools. Right. So to get them involved in innovation yes. in yes. this direction. And I agree completely with Thomas. The ecology. I mean, it's the technology, it's the internet, it's the environment, um, it's, the, it's the programs, it's the people. <laughs> yeah. But perhaps, okay. There are usually several ways on, on probably for institutional change. The very traditional one is to infuse new concepts and new infrastructure in the existing system. Very often failing. A second approach is what companies and many corporations for the schools do to create a third place. Business public. Mm -hmm. maker garages, uh, houses of, of the little researchers, what so on. Those are third places which are not school, but close to school. Yeah. And school might be attracted or not attracted. And the third way is to learn on the street, where we have not talked about. The whole issue of informal competencies learned on the street. Right. And, and a lot of American uh, entrepreneurs well, educators might not like to hear that, had given up their studies to found a company. <laughs> so they invest in entrepreneurship and not in formal education. Another way is to, to create extra, extraterrestrial space in a company. If you look at, at BMW in creating the electrical car, they had their own territory on the old territory with own batches, with own leadership rules, with own working time designs and whatsoever. So creating a creative territory in your own traditional space. But it always has to do that you somehow separate innovation from the rest. And perhaps in the next step, connect innovation and exploitation. Now, now, that's the, well, some of you might know that the, the concept of, of the ambidextrous organization, which is on the left hand as good as on the right hand, an exploration and exploitation. But those are very good ways to do that. But I'm, I'm and, and this also comes to the point, one of you ask rebels in organizations, people who think in a queer way, Naturally, you, they need spaces where they have freedom. 3M, 3M did it already since decades. One day a week is where you do your own thing. And that is, that is symbolic, let's say, for creating freedom and space for innovation. And then very often, talented people learn in a collaborative way. Very often, it's not the formal degree. Last comment, the name higher education might be obsolete nowadays. What is higher education? That's a very snobbish name. A lot of people do a lot of achievements with no higher education. Perhaps this hierarchy of degrees 
perhaps is some reason for being not innovative. 60% of all innovations in Germany come not from academics, but from people with a professional education. What's then high? Mm -hmm. Mr. Sang, okay. Yeah. Uh, I, I told you that uh, one of the, the secrets is the motivation. Mm -hmm. And I talked about Korea. And now I, I want to talk about the, the, the United States, Silicon Valley. And I agree with Thomas that uh, inf informal uh, competency uh, can be learned on the street, and literally on the street. When you just go to Silicon Valley, you, you, you can feel the atmosphere mm -hmm. and all whole environment is make you more uh, motivated. So uh, then how, how, how is it possible? What is the reason? I think it is uh, the system for the huge compensation. If you are a young startup, uh, a young student, college student, and you have an idea, you don't have to go to the college or finish the school. You just make a startup, and there's a two, way, two ways to be successful. One of is IPO and m and to the, then you can be a super millionaire. Then why is it uh, not possible in Europe? I, I, I was curious, why is it not possible in Europe? And I asked some, this question to many European leaders. And one of the answers are, is because of the fragmentation in the United States. There are huge, one single market, but it is not the case in Europe. So well, I don't know whether it is true or not, but it is up to you to solve the problem. Mm -hmm. And one of them, one, uh, the other reason is the generosity to, to failure. Because mm -hmm. in Korea, we have the same problem. Uh, even, even Samsung, we uh, launched a huge innovation center in Silicon Valley, not in Korea. Why? As I told you, it's atmosphere and environment. Just being there makes you more creative. So this is the very important uh, the, the element. Mm -hmm. but, uh, and one of the reasons uh, the many young genius go to Silicon Valley is that they are very generous for failure, which is not the case in Korea. It, it is very uh, risky if you quit school and, <laughs> and launch your own business, and the, the, the possibilities are really, really small to go to IPO or merge it to a big company. But in the, in the States, it is very, they can try repeatedly until they succeed. So, Please make it possible in Europe. <laughs> it's, it's up to you. Hey, um, just a, a comment. I, I spent 25 years in Silicon Valley, and uh, my sort of hypothesis of to support your point is um, Silicon Valley started that way. <laughs> so we're not we're, they're not they're not in a in a situation where they have to change their culture. Mm -hmm. The culture is rampant throughout Silicon Valley. I mean, the kids grow up, you know, their, their parents grew up, their, their grandparents grew up in that culture. Right. It, and it started with a seed. So Thomas talked about third places. Well, it, it's, it's, you, could, you could say that Silicon Valley was the third place relative to a lot of places in the world when it started. Mm. <laughs> and it's just grown. And so you can't avoid it. You can't ignore it. You can't, you can't hide from it. And so... I guess the, the challenge there is, um, uh, if you're not starting natively, you know, if, you, if you've already got a lot of inertia going down a path, and there's a lot of inertia um, here, um, how, do you, how do you cause that shift? Mm -hmm. you know, and, and I do believe that prototyping and jumping in and failing and then mm -hmm. demonstrating success and then having that propagate is, is, is a way. But it's still, there's a lot of inertia that's going to that's gonna fight it. Mm -hmm. So we started with coding and we ended with uh, society. And, uh, well, that's a path that I appreciate very much. And I would like to thank you all. I think we all have a right uh, for a coffee break now. And uh, thank you, everyone. Yes. <laughs>